Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Critical Care Nurse. Today we're going to be going over endotracheal extubation and nursing's responsibility before, during, and after the procedure. Now endotracheal extubation is a procedure by which we remove the endotracheal tube through a patient's mouth or nair because we have gathered enough information and can conclude that independent of the endotracheal tube, the patient can A, maintain a patent airway, B, oxygenate, and C, ventilate. Let's get started. Okay, so now we're going to be going over endotracheal extubation and things that we're going to have to do and prepare um, to make sure that we have a successful one. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that the patient is stable on pressure support or CPAP. And traditionally speaking, that'll be 5 of pressure support, 5 of PEEP, and 40% FiO2. We also want to make sure that the patient has an adequate SpO2, which is greater than or equal to 95%, and we want the respirations greater than or equal to 12. We also want to make sure that there's no episodes of apnea, and then also after that, um, we want to make sure the patient has an acceptable blood gas. Now, for, a, for an acceptable blood gas, um, we want a pH of 7.35 to 7.45, a PCO2 of 35 to 45, PO2 of 80 to 100, and a bicarb of 22 to 26. Um, now, I have an asterisk and a COPD at 55 to 60 there because sometimes, you know, we always have to look at um, the patient's um, past medical history and kind of what their baseline is. Because uh, many times I have extubated patients um, who have COPD where their PCO2s are in the 50s to 60 range. And, um, you know, the service is okay with it just because, you know, when they come in before surgery and their baseline um, PCO2 is in that range, we're not going to have them in the 35 to 45 range because that's just not what's normal for them. And that is not what their body's accustomed to. So sometimes in terms of the parameters that we will allow, um, we definitely have to look and tailor it to each um, patient condition and also their past medical history. Now once all of that is done, we're going to be looking at breathing parameters and physical tests. Um, so for this, we want a NIF of less than negative 20, and the NIF is the negative inspiratory pressure or force, and that is a measurement of um, respiratory muscle strength and um, ventilatory reserve. We also want to make sure that the patient has a SVC or a slow vital capacity of greater than 1,000 mLs. Um, and the, uh, SVC is a measurement of air that a patient can exhale after they inhale as deeply as possible. Uh, once again, we're always going to look at the patient's condition and kind of uh, what their past medical history is. And sometimes we'll allow for an SVC of 800, but usually the golden uh, mark is 1,000 or greater. We also want to make sure that the patient has a positive air leak. So by that, I mean we deflate um, the endotracheal tube cuff and want to hear some gurgling. Just because if there's upper airway edema and we don't hear that, um, we're going to have issues if we pull the tube and the upper airway closes and then we don't have patent airway. So making sure there's a, a positive air leak is um, something that sometimes a respiratory therapist will forget. Um, and, and it is our job to just kind of do a light reminder uh, for them to do it. We want to make sure that the patient also has a positive cough and a positive gag. Now these are two different things that a lot of nurses, a lot of respiratory therapists use interchangeably, but they are not the same thing. Now a cough um, reflex is if you have an endotracheal tube and you have the inline suction and you um, go in and suction them out and they're coughing. Um, the cough is more of a respiratory response. And uh, the gag is more of a gastric response of them like vomiting. So if we're, we take a yank hour and stick it in the back of their throat, that is a gag. So cough, once again, is more respiratory and gag is more um, gastrointestinal and uh, more of a vomiting reflex. Although both can kind of go hand in hand, they're definitely two different things and it's important to know the difference between the two. We also want to make sure the patient is following commands and they can also lift their head off the pillow. Now, this is not always the case, especially if they had a CVA. So if the patient if the patient has a known stroke and they're not really following commands or they have um, some focal deficits and they're not really doing much, um, as long as some of the other parameters are adequate and okay, um, we will extubate them even though they're not following commands or if they can't lift their head off the pillow. Now it comes to extubation time. So um, for extubation time, there's lots of things that you need to do to prep to make sure that we have a successful one. 
Um, the one of the things that I like to do is I also um, I always like to make sure that there's a chucks or a towel on the chest so we can make sure that the gown is clean. We'll have oral suction um, nearby, um, which we should already have. I'll have a bubbler with a nasal cannula at five liters. Um, at that point, I'll also take off the endotracheal tube holder or the tape, um, do some deep oral suction. Um, also do one last endotracheal tube suction. We'll deflate the pilot tube, and then we'll finally remove the endotracheal tube. Um, we'll want to prompt the patient to cough really hard, and we'll suction whatever gunk uh, comes up. We don't want that going down. And after we extubate, we're going to want to make sure to ask the patient their name, date of birth, um, kind of what their uh, what brought them in, and also uh, what procedure they had done, just to do your uh, standard um, um, A and O questions. Um, some nurses and some respiratory therapists like to keep the vent in the room um, just in case, and then, you know, 20 to 30 minutes post extubation, it's good form to draw gas. Now, issues that we can have um, for uh, endotracheal extubation is that if we have a wild person, so one of the things is that if the patient is just on propofol, um, it definitely helps sometimes to give them a little bit of fentanyl, some fentanyl pushes to keep the pain under control. Just so the, because the propofol as a sedative hypnotic will um, kind of keep them under, but then it does nothing for them to, con uh, to control their pain. So if they're you know, coming out of the haze and are in massive amounts of pain, it's not a very good recipe for um, waking up um, a happy camper. Now, one of the things that we can also do is give um, dexmedetomidine or Presidex. Um, it's a medication that we can give um, that has some sedative properties and also some analgesic properties, but then it doesn't um, decrease the respiratory drive. Now, with the dexmedetomidine, um, I've seen some really crazy wild patients. I'm talking about kicking and thrashing and trying to rip the restraints off trying to rip the endotracheal tube off that when they start the dexmedetomidine or the Presidex, um, they are actually very comfortable. They're very calm and cooperative. And it's pretty wild to see the difference. Now, sometimes the propofol fentanyl or the dexmedetomidine will not work, in which case we're just going to have to commando. Um, and this is my favorite, just because usually we'll have a fellow or an attending there. And, you know, we can't just extubate with no parameters and but you know if a patient is fighting that hard more often than not we can figure out that you know they will be able to protect their airway and um, they'll do okay with it because sometimes they just wake up they feel the tube in their throat they can't think clearly and they just go nuts so and sometimes you know as soon as you pull the tube out they're fine they look man I didn't like that and be like yeah I could tell now the issue that we can run into is that a patient has a uh, strider um, we will start some racemic epinephrine We'll also, um, another thing that we'll have to do as well is uh, reintubate. And we can also um, give them some steroids to help with inflammation. Now, uh, if we ha continue to have failed extubations, a trach um, is definitely in um, the plan. Uh, usually, I think for us, it's three failed extubations. Um, and then we'll definitely start thinking about um, doing a trach. So once again, oh, don't mind the grandfather clock. So once again, so for endotracheal extubation, we'll make sure the patient is stable on pressure support, so five and five and 40%. We wanna make sure the patient has adequate SpO2 greater than or equal to 95%, respirator is greater than or equal to 12, no episodes of apnea, acceptable blood gas, and once again, we're gonna be tailoring this to the patient's past medical history. So pH 7.35 to 7.45, PCO2 35 to 45, PO2 80 to 100, bicarb 22 to 26. We're going to do the breathing parameters and physical tests, so NIF of less than negative 20. Um, I had a patient recently who had a NIF of negative 44, and once again, we want the slow vital capacity of greater than 1,000, and his was like 5,400, so, so NIF of negative 44 and SVC of 5,400, I was like, this is the most I've ever seen, and this easily double the parameters that we usually want. Um, he was like a Taekwondo instructor and did a lot of breathing exercise, so I'm like, oh, okay, that totally makes sense. Uh, totally makes sense. So once again, we're going to want to make sure the patient has a positive air leak um, uh, and to make sure that they have a pain airway to either that or the upper airway closes. And if we don't give the racemic epinephrine in time, we're going to be doing an emergent cricothyroidotomy, which no one wants to do. We're going to also have so the positive cough, positive gag. Once again, two different things. Uh, very important to be able to differentiate between the two. 
Um, so we want to make sure the patient is following commands and lifts the head off the pillow. Once again, not completely necessary, especially for our neuro um, population and patients who have a stroke. So when it comes to extubation time, we'll do a chucks towel on the chest to make sure to keep the gown clean. Do oral suction, nasal cannula at five liters. Um, take off the endotracheal tube holder and tape. We're gonna do deep oral suction and endotracheal tube suction. I'll deflate the pilot. And um, you know, finally we'll remove the tube. We'll uh, have the patient cough and we'll suck up any of the secretions and you know, ask their A&O questions. We'll keep the bed in the room sometimes and then draw the gas. Um, 30 minutes after is always good for him. Once again, the issues that we can run into is that we have a patient who's a wild person. So if that's the case, we, um, and if they're just on propofol, we'll give them a little bit of fent. And if that doesn't work, um, we'll do the dexmedetomidine. After that, we'll commando extubate. And if the patient has strider, so just that horrible sounding breathing, racemic epinephrine if we have time, and then immediate reintubation, and then also steroids to kind of help with the inflammation there. And then if it gets really bad, um, an emergent cricothyroidotomy uh, is something that we can also do. And with multiple failed extubations, eventually a trach is in uh, the future for that patient. And once again, for the trachs, um, sometimes, you know, if a patient is intubated greater than seven days, usually definitely by the 21st day, we're um, going to be considering that. But then also if um, we have a patient who is... Um, has like influenza and has really bad respiratory failure and they're on VV ECMO. Sometimes my uh, attending thoracic surgeon will just be like, well, we're just going to trach them right away just because they're not going to be coming off of the vent anytime soon, especially being on the VV ECMO. So it's best just to do this so we can, provo um, we can dodge any drama in the future and just kind of get it done. All right. And that um, concludes all of the things that we're going to have to get prepared for. Um, when we're going to be doing an endotracheal extubation. Okay, so here we have a standard endotracheal tube. It's an eight centimeter tube, um, and also the endotracheal tube holder. So once again, the different parts of the endotracheal tube. We have the standard 15 millimeter connector, um, the tube itself. Here is the endotracheal tube holder. We also have the pilot balloon, and this is where we will either instill um, atmospheric air or um, take it out so that we can uh, deflate the endotracheal tube cuff here. So once again, when we are checking for a um, positive air leak, so that's one of the last things we're going to do, we're just going to take a standard 10 cc syringe, attach it to the pilot um, balloon, and we will take all the air out. And we'll do it all the way until you know we hear the patient gurgling. And as you can see, the endotracheal tube cuff here is deflated. Uh, so if the upper airway up here, let's say, is edematous, um, we're not going to be able to hear a gurgle. So we have a negative air leak. Um, so we have to wait. It's either that or we'll give some steroids, um, whether it be methylprednisolone or dexamethasone. It's kind of up to the team. Or we might just wait because sometimes the inflammation will go down by itself. Um, so when we... <clears throat> do the endotracheal extubation, we always want to make sure that we take um, the cheek part here off um, of the patient because there's some times where um, either the nurse or the RT, they are not um, in synchronization with each other and you know they'll deflate and one person's still pulling the tube and the endotracheal um, tube holder is still connected and then all of a sudden we um, are trying to remove things very quickly because this tube is in, we're trying to pull it out, the patient's coughing. So it's best to make sure that um, the soft part here, we take it off very slowly, and then it's also absolutely disconnected from um, the connector here. Very big things. Very, um, actually they're very small things, but they can be a big problem if you don't do it quickly enough and if you don't do it in the correct time, because um, then you're scrambling and it can get pretty scary. So I've had that happen to me once when I first started and I actually wasn't sure which things to watch and was just relying on the respiratory therapist. So once again, it's a team effort. Uh, we make sure that we uh, check each other's uh, work and um, it'll help for a positive and a successful endotracheal extubation. Thank you for watching. I hope I was able to help in some way, shape, or form, and if I did, please subscribe. Once again, thank you for watching The Critical Care Nurse. Let's save some lives.